Joseph, Brandon, and Bonnie. Thank you guys so much for leading us in worship this morning, man. I needed that, didn't you? I needed that. Worship for me always brings me to the presence of our King. To kind of refocus my heart and mind after a week full of doubts and fears and responsibilities and so much stuff on our plate. It's good for us to kind of settle our soul. To kind of find peace before we move into a time of reflection. To hear what God has for us today. You know, our, as, you, as Michael said at the beginning and our welcome to you guys is the purpose. The reason we gather is so that you and me can hear from God and that we can speak to Him. We create a time for worship to sing to Him. We, can, we believe that God's presence is here. We have an opportunity to, to sing praises back to the King. We also want an opportunity for you to hear from God. God wants to speak to you daily. And He is always speaking and sometimes we're not listening or I'm too busy or I've got too much going on. But God is always about speaking into your life and sharing more of who He is and what He wants for you. So we decide to carve out time. We are gathering time. This is the main focus. That's why we use a symbol of a, a, a signal tower. It's ascending and receiving. We can hear from and we can speak to God. This is why we gather. So that we can be encouraged, so that we can be taught, so that we can be inspired to move back out and be the hope that the city and this state and this country needs. It is important to gather, not because it's a to-do list or not because it's something you have to do, but it's something we get to do. It is a part when I get to gather with you and I get to hear Christ in your life and to see you when I see you I'm encouraged and vice versa hopefully we get to be together and I'm thankful for that and so as I said many times people say I couldn't make it this Sunday or that there's no guilt here there's no like oh I, you're, you got a little bad list now you don't got a star for the list that's not it if I ever text you and say I missed you I say it again it's not because I'm harping on you because I truly did miss you and your presence and what you could offer to help me in my life so we can talk, we continue our series on King. King is the idea that last week we looked at the story, a story that's so familiar, familiar during this Christmas time, the Christmas story. And we look at it, we can get so caught up in the baby and the manger and Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the and the, and the all the wise men and all that stuff that we forget that the magnitude of what this really this event really happened. That this was more than just a birth of a baby. This is the arrival of the king. The king of the universe, the same king that in Genesis said he spoke the world to existence. When he spoke, light happened. He began to form man and, and created relationship and life. This is the same king. And for some crazy reason, really, the more I look at it, every time I look at it, it really boggles my mind. It's hard for me to wrap around that the king of the universe, the, the king who had no beginning and no end, who was all-powerful, chose to enter into interaction with mankind as a little baby. But what I, if I don't understand it totally, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around. I know there's one thing for sure, that when the king chose to enter this way, he had an intentional reason for doing so. You see, the whole Old Testament is full of prophecies of old ancient prophets who spoke of the coming Messiah. And they were detailed. I mean, there's scripture in Micah talking about him coming in Bethlehem. And, and there is detail upon detail of prophecy of the Messiah, the promised one, coming. It was detailed. It was, it was foreknown for a long period. So God had an intentional reason. And last week, just for a, a little bit, we focused on, if, we, this, is, if this was a play, and we had characters, last week was, was uh, Act 1. And we look at the characters. We learn some things because it was intentional. God was very intentional to teach you and me about who He is and what He values. And we saw, first of all, God chose to come as a baby, to come into a, a, a stinking, nasty pig pen, a manger place, and be born to a young, inexperienced, had no right to be raising a child couple. He chose because, first of all, he was intentional from the beginning that God, through Jesus, is not interested in religion. There was a point in, in Jerusalem where the temple was, and that's where all religious practice happened. And if God was interested in telling you, you know how you can connect to me, you can connect to me through religion, then he would have been born or showed up in the temple. And we walked out from the Holy of Holies and said, hey, I'm here. 
That would be the way, if he's trying to show you that religion is the way to get to him. And that we can take comfort in, that God does not ask us to go to church so we can get, to get approval by him. He doesn't ask us to continue to be better and better so he can finally like us. No, Jesus said, I came in relationship and he chose the most intimate style of relationship to show that he is seriously interested in that. He chose to be born as a helpless baby, the most intimate type of relationship, a mother and child. He chose that on purpose. He chose that to remind you of me. He's not interested in your to-do list or how good you can be. He understands that you can never be good enough to get to him on your own. But he was interested in one thing. He died. He came. He died. He rose again because he is passionately interested in a relationship with you and me. And he took care of every obstacle in the way so that I can come before him. He took care of the biggest obstacle because my imperfection and sin. He paid for it on the cross so that I could stand in his presence and he could look at me and his child and say, I love you. If you just trust me, I will give you the steps and the power to walk the life that I want you to live. That's the first thing he spoke when he came as the king. Not only that, he chose to work behind the scenes and come in front stage. Again, he could have come into the capital city, but he chose the backwoods town of Bethlehem. Small, podunkville. He chose that. He didn't choose to be born into a wealthy, uh, famous family, but an unheard of, not even married yet, couple. Why did he do that? Because God wants us to know that in our lives, in our lives, when we don't see him working, don't count God out. Because he may not be showing up the way we think he will show up. And he may not be there when, we, when we're looking for him to rescue us in this way. And we're desperate to see him. And we don't see him work the way we think we need him to work. The fact of the matter is God understood exactly what he was doing. And even though all of Israel was still looking for the king coming, he was already there. He worked behind the scenes in our lives. And finally, he chose an unlikely cast to do an imaginable task. He chose an unlikely cast to do an unimaginable task. And that should give us hope. Because you see, well, I'm, not the, I'm probably not the one God's going to use because of my past or because of my experiences or because of that. Let me tell you something. God does not look at what you can do for Him, but are you interested in being used by Him? Because He can use anyone. He chose an unwed mother to be the mother of him. He chose a man, a, a Joseph, who was a good guy but had a plan and interrupted his plan because he was looking for people who were saying, you know, ultimately what they said? Every time the angel said, God has chosen you, what they end up saying? They said, your will be done. Whatever you want, you are the king. You see, in our life, God is not interested in looking for perfect people. Aren't we glad for that? He doesn't need perfect people. He's not interested in perfect people because perfect people have not grasped the power of His grace. You see, God in my life had taken from a place to understand that God's grace is so much bigger for me. I was a pretty good kid growing up. I didn't do too crazy things. I thought, I'm alright. But then when God let me see just who I am and how rebellious I am to God because I want to be the king of my life and not put Him in control, how evil that really is. And then I realized that God still loved me that God still died for me and offers His hand to use me if I just surrender to Him, then it doesn't matter who you are or what your past is, God wants to use you. Just be willing to be used. That's where we were last week. We talked about the arrival of the King. If we want to go to phase two or act two of the play, we would not look not at the arrival of the King, but a rival of the King. Y'all with me on that? Not the arrival of the king, but a rival of the king. You see, we follow, we begin to take this act two of the story of Jesus coming into earth. And we follow it in Luke 2, the passage we read a lot of times. But now we're going to transition to Matthew. The reason we're going to Matthew, why Matthew pinpoints on this particular thing, because Matthew was a Jew of the Jews. I mean, he was a, I mean, he was named Levi. I mean, he was, he loved Jewish people. And so his purpose was to point out his whole reason he wrote the book of Matthew was to the Jewish people to help them see Jesus as the king. And so you look through all of Matthew, you will see, if you read it, him pointing out things to help you see Jesus as king. And so it's no, it's no surprise that when he talks about the birth of Jesus, his focus is on his kingship. And he's like, if this is a king being born, there's going to be national and international ripple effects, right? I mean, every time a king's born, the world knows. No matter how private it is, I mean, when, you know, when, um, when the Britain, when they had their baby, it was, it was known, right? Everybody was watching. Everybody, it was wide world known. So Matthew's like, this is the king. So it has to be national and international ripple effects. 
And so his focus is on this. And we're going to look into it just for a few moments, man. I want you to open your heart today. Because I believe in all of my heart, my, the Holy Spirit in me says that God wants to speak to us today. He wants to inspire us. He wants to move us. He does not want us to be consistently just steady sitting there. He wants to inspire us to move out and be on mission for Jesus Christ. And so we're going to see that happen today. We're going to look at the character. we got Matthew chapter 2. We're going to jump in. And, and Matthew talks a little bit about Mary and Joseph. But then he jumps right into this part of the story. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea. And he skipped the whole other part about the shepherds. He was like, we're going to get to the main stuff, all right? That was all cool, what happened to the star, you know, with the shepherds coming and the little manger and all that. But here we go. He was born in Judea. During the reign of King Herod, look who he brings in. His first cast of characters, who he brings in is the king of the Jews. King Herod was the king of the Jews. He had been put in power by Rome about 40 B.C. And he wasn't put there because he deserved it, but because he bribed his way, he pleaded his way, he fought his way into this position. And so he was the king of the Jews under the servant rule of the iron fist of Rome. And even though he was king, he really was under the, under the control of Rome. But in that kingship, he took advantage of the people. And his main desire, you can look at historians, his desire was to make a, his name known. That was his purpose. He wanted people to remember him. And he was very sketchy of anybody that could threaten his hard-earned position. This is King Herod. So King Herod, uh, and, today we're King, and about that time, some wise men, we are in the second part of characters. Wise men in Greek is magi, alright? And it was, it was the people probably from Persia. Um, a lot of scholars say that they were from Zoroasterism, which was a uh, uh, a religious system that looked to the stars to find answers and they were the they were the priests of that system and they were constantly looking at stars to find answers for life and for what mysteries are going on. So this is these people are, are coming. And so they land rise in Jerusalem and ask, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? He saw a star as it arose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this. Now let's just make it very clear, deeply disturbed. King Herod had already um, killed his second wife and three of his children because they offered a threat to his kingship. And so he was not a man. When you heard deeply disturbed with King Herod, you took notice. Now what's interesting is I was reading that. It jumped out to me. If you were there last week, Mary had the same response. When the angel said, you were gonna, you're chosen to bring forth the king, when you remember what she said? She was disturbed and confused. Understandable. That's pretty intense news. So Herod and Mary, when they heard the news, initially had the same feeling, a disturbed, what's going on here? But, here's where we're going to land today. Their choice after that was drastically different. See, when Herod was disturbed, he then began to play the religious card, but ultimately sought to kill this rival. Let's continue to read the scripture real quick. He was certainly heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the, of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is this Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judah, they said, For this is what the prophet wrote, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you, who will be your shepherd. For my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise man, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared, and he told them, Go to Bethlehem, search carefully for this child, and when you find him, come back and tell me, so I can go and worship him too. <laughs> After this, Henry the wise men went in their way, and they started and had them seen in the east, got into the Bethlehem. It was then ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned their own way by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. After the wise man had gone, the angel of the Lord also appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother. The angel said, Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt and with the child of Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This is filled with the Lord has spoken through the prophet, I called my son out of Egypt. 
Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to the king up, up, killed all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years and older and under based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Look, this story has a lot of drama. I mean, who can make this stuff up? I mean, it's crazy. King Herod hears about the king's arrival and automatically begins to associate and put him as a rival of the king. See, he was so consumed with making his own name and making his own way. In fact, he was, if you look at the time period, he did a lot of building. He was a king that wanted to have his name go on forever. He wrote, he built Herod's temple. In fact, one, the western wall is still there, the last part of that temple. But his whole purpose was make a name for himself that people would remember him when he died. In fact, this is crazy. He was so consumed that people would remember him and they were afraid that when he died that nobody remembered him. He ordered 2,000 men to be killed the day he died. In order just there would be some kind of mourning because he was so afraid of dying alone with nobody caring for him. And so what he did, he lived his life in defense of anyone else making and ruling him. And man, I, you, there's a couple truths I want to go here with us. Because all of us have that opportunity like Herod or Mary. There is only one room. See, Herod, Herod understood one thing. There's only room for one king in, in his life. And there's only room for one king in, your, in, in our lives. And we must come to the place because we're just like Herod. I'm just like Herod. I feel threatened when I hear God say, you must surrender your life to me. And, and I begin to think about, well, if I give my life over to God, what is He going to ask of me? And He's going to make me do something I don't like. And it's going to be scary. It's gonna, my life is over if I give my life to Jesus. And if I just surrender my will to Him. I've got a name to make for myself, and I've got things I want to accomplish, and I feel like if I decide to give it all and surrender to God, that for some reason in my head, I think when I do that, then I lose any ability to make a difference in this world and to make something that lasts beyond me. And so we wrestle just like Herod wrestled. And so when we just decide to see Jesus as our rival, and as our answer, we begin to fight against Him. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll maybe do the religious thing and we'll come to church, but down deep we know in our hearts that, man, I don't know if I can give everything to God. It's scary. Would you agree with me? It's, it's, it's scary. When I hear God ask something of me, it freaks me out. Because there's a lie in my head that says, this king is coming to ruin my life. But you know what the very fact of the matter is? The very thing that Herod was looking for will be found if he had given his life over to the true king. See, Jesus did not come to strip him of his title, but to free him to be who he was always meant to be. That's the beautiful part. See, we're not going to sit here at Radius Church and say, just beat you over the head because you're not giving your life to the king. I want to help you understand that this king has not come to strip you of who you are and your gifts and your talents and your personality and your passions. This is not what he's coming to do. He is coming to free you to be who you're always meant to be, that part of you that says, you know, if I could just find the effort, if I could just feel the freedom I could do. And God says, I came as the king, died on the cross, and took care of your chains. I'm not here to enslave you. I'm here to free you. And here's the, here's the lie that you and me, we hear sometimes. When we hear God say, give our, surrender our will to Him. We begin to think about, well, what's going to happen? And, and what, what's He going to ask of me? And we have this lie, I have this lie in my head. That I can be king of my life. I can just, I can, take, I can take this on my own. I can pull myself up by the bootstraps. I'm strong enough. I'm smart enough. Dang it, people like me. <laughs> and I can make this happen. And I'll be the king of me. But do y'all know something? It's a lie. We're never king of ourselves. Because if we choose not Jesus as our king, something else becomes our king. Fear, guilt, shame, lust, depression. You see, because, man, this is beautiful. We were meant to be ruled by the King of Kings. This is where we thrive. This is where we experience true life. And as long as we continue to resist this kingship, 
we will be controlled by another king. And that king is, is the king that controls us and puts us in chains. And the one that we find, have you ever found yourself in a place you just cannot seem to stop or get out of? Don't you hate that place in life? I've been there. I'm like, God, I, I, know, I, I know I shouldn't do this, but I just cannot stop and feel like I'm just chained to it. You know what it is? It isn't about me giving up that or giving up this or being a better person. You know what it ultimately comes to? It comes to me saying, look, am I surrendered my life to the king? Because once I do it to the rightful king who owns the universe, I am freed from the chains that seek to, in, to enslave me. That's, that's hopeful. That's encouraging. You see, Jesus came and Herod saw him as a rival. And ultimately, his life was enslaved that way. Like I said, the rest of his life, Josephus said, one of the early historians of the time, said that his, Herod's reign was known as a tyrant and it was consumed with depression and paranoia. He was a king. I'm, you know, sitting here, man. I hope if you're new and you're thinking, man, this guy's preaching. I'm not preaching. I'm preaching with you. I'm listening to this. Because we all struggle releasing our will to God. <clears throat> but the greatest lie of the enemy says that his will is the one that will kill you. But the very opposite is true. When we choose to say, Jesus, I'm not perfect and I struggle and I don't know if I, but I got, I give you me. Use me. As Mary said, use me however you want. You will begin to see. It's not because Blake says so. It's because the Bible promises it and shows it that when you finally surrender everything to Him, you will be freed to be what you're called. <coughs> There's hope in that. So the second set of characters that Matthew happens to mention, we're we'll going to be done after this, is that when Matthew was brilliant, because he looks like as he's talking about King Herod, he introduces the Magi, the wise men from the east. And he all, almost looks at them, and, and if you look at it and read it really down, you look at its comparison. They both recognize the king. The Magi came from far east. They were always looking at the stars, looking for angels, looking for signs, looking for truth. And they looked. They were, they were known internationally as astrologers. If you, and they didn't look at it as a magic. They looked at it as a science. And so they were diligent. If you wanted to know something about the stars, you went to them and they'd tell you what was in the sky and where it was going and what was going on. All of a sudden, one day, the Magi, in their little comfortable place, wherever that in the east, they see something new they'd never seen before. Man, that's, that shit gets me excited, man. They saw, they'd seen, they'd seen the cycles of life. They'd seen the stars move throughout history. They'd had books written and things knowing this is what always happens. This is what always rises and this is what always sets. But one day, these magi, these stargazers found something different that they'd never seen before. It was moving differently. It wasn't something that they'd seen happen before. And they understood through that star that somehow there was a king being born. And unlike Herod, when he saw a king, he saw his arrival and he chose to fight. The Magi, when they saw the king, they, they saw an answer. They saw the solution. They found truth and decided to follow. Maybe you're sitting here today you have more questions about Jesus and God than you have answers. Well, this is the place for you. This is, we're not going to judge you and say, I don't know if I believe in God yet. I don't know if I can wrap my mind around this. Do not feel guilty. This is why we exist. To help you see who God is. That He has come to give you hope and life. So if you have those questions, this is, you're, you're welcome. This is where we're at. You see, these magi were looking for answers. And they finally, because they kept seeking. You see, when they saw something that intrigued them, they pursued it. They pursued it. The scripture, Matthew chapter I think chapter 7. Seven and eight. It's Jesus talking here. He says, Keep on asking, you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. The king stood in front of his kingdom and pronounced this. You're seeking who truth is. You want to seek what real reality is. You want to seek life. You pursue finding truth and you will find it. 
And ultimately he says, I, and in John chapter 14, verse 6, we talked about it a couple weeks ago, he proclaimed to his followers in his kingdom, another time as king, and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You will find the way to God through me. So he pronounces, look, seek truth and you will find it. The wise men sought it. And I think that's why they follow this maybe months, following the star, figuring out what's going to happen, what's going to come to the end of it. You know, the fact of our life, there's many things we follow after, aren't we? We find the next glittering thing and we look at it and we think, that's where truth is. This is what's going to satisfy me. Have you ever been there? I have. I've been there thinking, if I just get this or just get that, if I just find this and I come to the end and there's nothing there. Y'all with me? Do you know what I'm talking about? We try our own desires, our own, our own uh, wants, and everything that we think that will give us life. And we come to the end of it, and we find emptiness. This is why I think when the wise men finally make it to the house, look at the response. Then we have it up there. We'll go in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, then skip 9 to 11, Mike, Michael, real quick. Matthew chapter 2, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Judah, during the reign of Herod. About that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? So they saw a star as it rose, and, went, and we have come to worship him. You go to the next verse, and there's a 9. After the interview, the wise men went their way, and the star had, had seen in the east, guided them to Bethlehem. And went ahead and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. You know where that joy is coming from? They've been searching all their life among the stars, looking for an answer. Maybe that's you. You've been searching for truth. You've been finding and seeking and trying to find out different ways of where it is. And every, every little trail you went, you came and there was nothing there. But the moment came when the wise men who kept following came and the star stopped. And when they went inside, they were overcome with joy because there was someone there. The truth was there. And when they saw the king, they were no longer worried about the star. They saw what they were searching for. And what they did, and what we are called to do, as we're going to call to be wise men, when we understand who the king is, they fell and they worshipped him. Because they understood who the king was. Are you searching? Are you searching? You just want to find what life is about? Can I tell you, you will find it in Jesus Christ. And when you understand that He is the King, you will respond in worship. How they, how they respond in worship? They offered their gifts. We get here at 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning and this place is empty. There is nothing set up. We come in, we start working. Most of the time, we're happy. <laughs> Sometimes it gets old. But you know what Jesus tells me as I walk out of my car and I stand and I get to put chairs down? I'm not doing it. For radius. I'm not doing it for myself. I'm using who I am to serve the king. And that, my friend, makes every ounce of work and inconvenience worthwhile. We're serving the king of glory. We're serving the king of kings. We're serving the one that no matter what happens in life, never loses hope and never loses control. We serve the king when life ceases to exist. He is still there as radiant and as powerful as he's ever been. And my purpose in life is not to find my own way, and not to make a name for myself, but to see the king and serve Him. And one day the Bible says that one day we will see Him and if we have been a faithful servant of the King, He will look to me with eyes and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And let me tell you, those words alone are far greater than any gold street, mansion, or any attorney in heaven to see the King look at me and say, well done, you served me well. They offered their gifts. 
gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It calls to you and me to offer our gifts to the service of the king. I'm, I'm not going to tell you what your gift is. You know it. Maybe it's something you're talented at. Maybe it's something you're gifted at. Maybe it's something you're passionate about. Use it. Use it for what God has given you. Maybe it's something in society you can use it for to build somewhat of a name for yourself, but it's not about that. Use your time, your talent, and your treasure. Offer it to the king because only then, only then, only then will we ever have something that lasts beyond us. The only time. You see, if Herod kept his gold and kept his all, his all, you know what he's known for? As a madman, tyrant, and he has a half-crumbled wall. The wise men gave their gifts. And who knows? I don't know. The scriptures don't say. But where do you think Joseph and Mary had the finances to get to Egypt? Was it not for the gifts of the wise men gave? Who knows? But I guarantee they were useful. You see, they use their gifts for God's glory. They use their potential for God's plan. And you and me are called today. Let go of the fear. Let go of the worries. Let go of building your own kingdom. Surrender your will to His kingdom. And in that, you will find your peace. You will find the power to live. And you will ensure that you and your life will matter more than just the dates between on your tombstone. It will move beyond that. Because what they did, they ensured the king would find the cross to rescue the world. We serve a king. Let's not see him as a rival. Let's see him as the answer. Let's pray.